Thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to share some of the insights that we do have on uh, one of our new schools, or I guess a new, new presentation on another one of our schools, uh, Basis International School, Guangzhou. It's part of our series, uh, you know, sharing insights on the schools across our network of Basis International Schools. Today, we'll be covering uh, Basis International School, Guangzhou. We'll also touch on aspects of being a part of the Basis International Bilingual School Network. We'll share details of the benefits and some of the visa requirements that we do have. And uh, then we'll have Q&A at the end. So as you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit questions you might have through the Q&A. At the bottom in the menu, there's a Q&A button. Go ahead and use that to submit your questions. And then we'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation today. So presenting today, uh, myself, uh, my name is Tim Smith and I'm Vice President of Global Talent. Um, be, joining, uh, be joined today by Dr. Erica Smelter, who is the head of school for Basis International School of Guangzhou. And lastly, we do have Diana Martinez Yagi, who is the international recruiter that works specifically with our school in Guangzhou. So today, uh, we'll be talking specifically about Basis International School Guangzhou. And uh, Today, we're being joined by uh, Dr. Erica Smeltzer. Erica is, uh, was actually one of the um, uh, founding members of the Basis International Schools as we opened up our first school in Shenzhen. I was there for a while. I'll save some of the details for Erica to share and present. And uh, Erica, we really do appreciate you joining us today, but um, I'm really excited to hear a little bit more about the school that you have there in Guangzhou. And uh, any additional details that, uh, that uh, you want to uh, provide. So Erica, thanks again for joining us today. Excellent, great, thank you, Tim. Um, so I have mentioned this before, but Tim and I have worked together for ages. I've been with the Basis Network for eight years and Tim is one of the first people I met in my first month at Basis opening up the Shenzhen School. So it's always nice to see him again. Um, as he said, I have been with the network for a while. I started at Basis Shenzhen, um, where I held a variety of positions. I've done everything from teach primary, middle school, high school. I have been a divisional director, and I have been the director of academic programs, as well as, of course, head of school at that campus by the time I left. Um, my background, a little bit about me, I did start off my world in schools as an academic. I have a PhD in literature, um, and so naturally I, I am by trade an English teacher. I spent a long and lovely time at that flagship school, um, Basis Shenzhen, and then after a while I had, I had, you know, grown to love the school. I was comfortable there. Um, I really helped to build the community and the structure there. And I decided I wanted to try something new. Um, in the world of K through 12 education, there's boarding schools and there is not boarding schools. Shenzhen is a day school. And I decided I really wanted to branch out and experience all I could um, in terms of what we have to offer in the basis network. So I joined Basis Guangzhou um, because it's a boarding program. So it was actually the first international school that BASIS had that had a boarding program. Um, it's a five-day boarding program, and as an incoming head of school, of course, you can probably anticipate it offers a lot of um, opportunities for anxiety, because as, as a day program head, I thought, Ooh, there's just so many more new and interesting things that can go wrong, potentially. Um, but as, as is usually the case, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, the boarding program has grown to be one of the things I am most fond of on campus. As a head of school, I often work late, um, and it's lovely to have the energy and joy that the kids bring um, to the campus and to my work. Um, through those hours that, that lead into after school. Um, personally, as an educator, my favorite thing about working with students is not the classroom time, which I also enjoy, but it is the out of class time. So bumping into students in the hallways, sharing ideas, um, getting to help them find their water bottle or what have you. And so the boarding program really just offers a lot of opportunities for that. Um, one of the things I did want to talk about as well was our, our graduating students, our seniors. So a while ago, we had our first graduating class, um, 2021, first group of seniors. Um, now, of course, we're on our, we're on our third round. 
and we're really proud of them. As a relatively young campus, um, we have we are in our sixth year of operation. Um, so old enough to know what we're doing, not old enough to have really solidified um, what our traditions are. Our senior, seniors are really our kind of vanguard in tradition making. Um, and so if you look at that central picture there, you'll see these beautiful little phoenix dolls. They are phoenixes. Our seniors insist that they look like little chickens. So the phoenix, the phoenix is our our school mascot. Um, and actually those little chickens, uh, phoenixes, phenai, um, were designed by our seniors from several years ago. And every year now they've developed a tradition, it's called the Phoenix Frenzy. Um, and several lucky teachers are gifted with plush phoenix phoenixes um, and the seniors are challenged to try to steal them. Um, if you have your phoenix plushie stolen by a senior, then at the end of the week you are forced to do the chicken dance in front of uh, an eager audience of high school students. So this has been something that's on its second year running now and it is potentially the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Um, and it's it really is all to the credit of our um, kind of ingenious senior class and their desire to build traditions. I know that in the hallway just the other day, I was uh, a bunch of huge towering teenage senior boys, Dr. Smelter, Dr. Smelter, video of this. And they, they made me take out my camera and, and they waited eagerly um, to accost one of our beloved um, teachers in the hallway. They're not actually allowed to physically touch you, uh, but they wanted to startle him enough that he potentially would drop his plushie. Um, un unluckily for them, it was one of our chattier faculty members and they ended up waiting a very long time for him to come out of the middle school office, um, but they were very dedicated and, and that's the point. Um, so the the seniors are really, really um, important to establishing our culture on campus. And the next slide, I just wanna talk about a few of the things that um, make our school beautiful. So our seniors actually are able to be TAs, uh, teaching assistants in their senior year. And so they can help anyone in the school, any faculty member. And a lot of them um, do something that I think is really beautiful, which is they decide to help out an ECE in primary. Um, one of the things I love about our campus is that it's a through school. So we have students as young as three years old and as old as 18. Um, and when those seniors go down and help out the little ones, um, it's one of the most beautiful things. Um, I've, I've put some campus celebrities on this, uh, this slide. So the first one that you'll notice is this um, golden dinosaur. It's not actually big, it's very small, but it's uh, the golden dinosaur award is something we give out in ECE. It's a character trait reward. So every, every month we choose a student who's done a particularly great job of exhibiting kindness or um, integrity and they get to hold the golden dinosaur and have their portrait taken with our head of ECE, who's also our vice head of school, uh, Miss City, who's up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, the other celebrity that's on here is Felix, the Phoenix, um, who is our campus mascot. Um, we had the mascot as an image, the Phoenix that could be either plush and friendly or of course, fiery and majestic. Um, and last year, a group of our students had done what they always do, which is they've watched a lot of movies and they wondered, all these, all these high schools in the United States have like costumes, mascot costumes. Why don't we have a mascot costume? And so they actually did a, a presentation to myself and uh, our business teacher and our head of high school, and they had a full plan. So they had found somebody to source the costume. They had designed the costume. They had pictures of the costume from different angles. And they said, all we need is for you to say we can do it and it's done. Um, and so that, that costume actually is being worn by one of the seniors who had designed it and kind of gave birth to the concept. And now he's a, um, a very prominent figure in our primary assemblies, which is what that picture is of there, or ECE events. Um, and it's just a really lovely example of how our students are proactive and um, create culture and community in the school. Um, on the upper left, uh, well, 
it's my upper left. I hope it's your upper left. I don't know. Um, the, you'll see a bunch of women dressed in silly costumes. One of them is me. Um, not silly, of course. It's actually a picture of our International Women's Day celebration. This is an annual event um, that we've been doing for a long time now. Um, every, every International Women's Day, we have a banquet for our senior ladies who are going away um, and gaining their independence when they go to college. Um, and last year, the theme was um, brilliant women from history. So we're all dressed up as uh, women that we admire. And this event is also prompted by our Spectrum Club. So we have a club on campus that is devoted to promoting um, issues of gender and um, diversity and inclusion on campus. And this is just one of the brilliant events that they have done. So that was one of their great events. The, they've also done this year, they did a women's empowerment event. Um, and that was a TED talk where they inv invited external speakers um, from companies or from school leadership or artists to give talks to women to inspire them in their future work. So if you could move to the next slide. Um, one of the things that I get a lot of questions about and really want to support with is um, our students' mental health um, and wellness and academic support. So we are a rigorous program. Um, there's a lot that we ask of our kids. And of course, we need to support them in their work. Um, so one of the ways that we do that is academic support. Um, the other way is with our social emotional learning support. For academic support, we have academic su support advisors. So students are given one-on-one -on -one support by a faculty member that they know and trust to help them build their executive skills, organize their locker, plan, look, do forward planning, um, think backwards from their major assessments or tasks, um, and also to provide motivation and encouragement. We also provide student hours. So those are drop-in hours for students. We provide these um, from primary all the way up. Um, they're organized slightly differently for our first, second, and third graders, of course, but all students have the opportunity to reach out individually to their teachers, either um, for support in their homework or issues that they're struggling with, or um, if they just have an area that they really, really are interested in and want to know more about. They have a designated time where the teacher is available to them and um, can offer them insights into microbiology or support with question number three on their homework. Um, so that is something that we're really proud of. And we're also proud that those um, student hours are highly attended. So students do find them useful um, and productive and frequently reach out for help, which I think says great things about the level of trust in our, um, in our program. You'll also see Caring Chloe, the cat in the bottom left-hand corner. That's actually our Dean of ECE, um, and that's her SEL persona. Um, so she gives every week, she goes into ECE classrooms and gives a little mini lesson on um, growing, recognizing emotions, um, social, social learning, which is, of course, a lot of what ECE learning is. Um, for our older students in primary, middle school, and high school, every grade from grade one to 12 has... Um, mental health classes. So these are classes run by our professional counseling staff. Um, every two weeks, they'll have one of these lessons um, where the counseling staff can give them instruction and in, um, self-image, reflection, um, developing relationships, things like that, and also make sure that kids know that our counselors are there to support them. Um, in middle and high school, we also have advisory. So it's a uh, small group advisory for middle school and one-on-one -on -one advisory in high school. So every high school teacher, me included, um, has a small group of kids that they meet one-on-one -on -one every other week to check in, um, talk about life. It's actually one of my favorite parts of the day. Um, I, I have about nine advisees, so I meet with one every, every weekday, more or less. Um, and it is a beautiful part of my day to just sit and talk and get to know um, one of one of my students a little bit better um, and know what they're going through and, and how, how life is treating them. Um, because of course, our goal is not just to teach kids, but also just to grow, grow well-rounded human beings. So in our next slide, you'll see um, some pictures of our athletics and clubs. 
these are two areas of school that as a head of school, I have been incredibly dedicated to developing. Um, I did the same when I was at the Shenzhen campus. Um, we have, when I joined Guangzhou, we weren't a member of any official leagues, um, sports leagues. So there were no official venues for competition, um, which I think is a healthy part of team sport life. And we are now, as of this year, a member of three separate sports leagues here in China. So offering our kids a lot of um, healthy room for growth and learning from success and failure, how to be how to be a good winner, how to be a good loser. Um, it's been a really great time. I've spent a lot of time with the volleyball team, which I think we have a picture of on this slide. Um, and in addition to building athletics, we've also um, built our club program. And clubs at Guangzhou is something that we do extremely well. We have the most clubs of any school in the network. Um, last year, we had 80 plus. Um, this year we have 50 plus. It's not actually because we are any less enthusiastic about them, but because we decided to do fewer to a higher level of quality. So those clubs are run either by students who are passionate in a particular subject or by teachers who want um, to expose students to something that they're deeply passionate about. Um, and that is run through our director of our, our dean of student activities, who's an incredible person, puts together um, club fairs annually to help kids gain exposure to all the different things the school has to offer. Um, it's a really, really amazing part of what we do. Um, we actually, I'm the advisor for the newspaper club, um, and we just published our first ever um, Basis Guangzhou student newspaper. Um, and uh, I think one of the proudest moments for me, these are, they actually, we're all former English students of mine. And one of the students came to me and she had an idea for a front page feature. Um, and one of the things I love about our kids is that they are precocious, uh, brilliant people, um, slightly, they can be sassy in all the right ways, right? You, you never want a completely compliant high school student. Um, and anyone who comes to China thinking that all the students are um, cookie cutter regulated and, uh, and do, do everything you say is, is very wrong. Um, they are just as exciting as students anywhere else. Um, and she came to me and she said, I have an idea for a front page article, but I don't know if it's okay. And I said, well, what is it? And so the, the title is, why didn't you? And it's a scathing criticism of all the high school students who thought they were too, too cool to participate in our school's spirit week. Um, and the, the tagline is, do you really like your school uniform that much? And she was worried that it was too cheeky. And I, I reassured her that it was just cheeky enough. And I would hope I, that's exactly what I would hope for from a school newspaper. Um, so that was that was a moment of pride for me. Um, you'll also see we have a fashion design club. I think that's up in the top left. Um, those dresses were designed by some of our senior girls and actually they designed them to wear to prom and to their graduation, which many of them actually did. So um, one of our house parents who's a, a dorm parent because many of our seniors do stay in the dorms um, had an evening club where they would design their own clothes and then they did eventually wear them. So they were very proud of that. Um, and on the next slide. So our students are amazing and we provide them with amazing opportunities, but we are only able to do that because we have great teachers that provide these opportunities for them. Um, and so it's really, really important to me that I provide our community with the best possible people. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm talking to you here today. Um, and it's an, a responsibility that I take very ser seriously. Um, because not only do I have a beautiful community of teachers that I want to maintain and cultivate and support, but I also have an amazing group of students um, that I'm very proud of, which you've probably noticed. Um, and I want to provide them with the best possible mentors and role models. Um, and so the excellence of our staff, our existing staff and the excellence of the staff that we bring in is something that I hold close to my heart and take very seriously. Um, and part of that, of course, is to support our teachers in their work. Um, well, everybody that we that comes to us comes to us as an amazing person, right? We're all in different places in our journeys as teachers. And I, I'm open to younger teachers who are taking risks, trying new things, developing their craft, um, trying to explore all the different new innovations that there are in teaching and cutting edge research. I'm also open to established teachers who've been around for a long time um, and are really confident in what they do in the classroom. And our job as a school, I think, is to make sure that 
all of those people who come in are capable of succeeding in our school and being happy here with us. Um, and also making sure that all of those people, regardless of where they are in their career, um, have the opportunity to grow and perfect their craft. So um, whether it's a young career teacher or a teacher who has well established in the field, um, making sure that they feel like they're getting what they need to really hone their skills and grow. Um, and when I said making sure teachers are comfortable here and ready to be happy, a big part of what I do is just try to develop and support the strong community we have here. Um, we have a, in our management team, where my, my managers laugh at me sometimes because there's a, stand, a standing item on our agenda every, every week when we meet and it's PPI and PIF. Uh, PPI and PIF is what I like to call it. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's something that's become a joke now, but it's, it's very actually serious. Um, and that's presume positive intentions and give positive individualized feedback. Um, and it's something that is, I, I, some people can think it's fluffy or, or whatever. I mean, you can, you can be, you can be grumpy and sarcastic and, and write it off, but I think there's no better way to motivate people and make people feel seen than one, to always assume that they are doing their best and trying their best, um, no matter what their outcomes are, right? That, that whatever mistake they've made or success they've had in that moment, they were making the decision that they thought was best and most possible for them. Um, and the other is, it's one thing to say, thanks guys for all your hard work. It's another thing to go up to an individual and really make sure that they feel that the, their work has been seen um, and to make sure that they know exactly um, where you've identified their excellence and strength and that you have recognized that in them as an individual person. So those are kind of parts of our, our management style and approach that, that we do take seriously and are reminded of every week. Um, Great. So the, you know, we are, I, I talk a lot about community and I, I don't want um, people to feel like they are forced or obligated to think of the school as their family. There in no way do we expect or demand that of people. I think what we want when we invite people to this kind of beautiful environment that we've cultivated over the years, um, we just want people who are ready to enter into a, a trusting, creative, and supportive relationship with the professionals around them. Um, that doesn't have to be interpersonal. Um, you don't have to be friends with everyone, but just be, everyone's ready to be friends, right? We are a very open community um, and definitely as colleagues to enter into um, trusting, supportive, professional relationships. I think it's it's really important to us, the people who join um, want more than, than to just move between their classrooms um, and are looking forward to those interactions with students and with faculty outside of the classroom. All right, so next, next slide. Um, we are known, and I'm very proud of this, um, we are known as one of the campuses with the strongest sense of community. So we, you know, sometimes, sometimes I get made fun of as, oh, Guangzhou, everyone's, everyone's just, um, you know, spitting rainbows and and unicorns. So that's, that's not entirely true. Um, in fact, many of my fa favorite faculty members are charming, charmingly grumpy people, right? Um, but we are family friendly. So if you have children, um, if you have spouses, we have a lot of families here on campus. Um, and I think that does help us build a sense of community. Um, we have at oodles of singles, uh, young singles as well. Um, but for people who have spouses and children, there's definitely a, a community of other families that are here to support you um, and, you know, exchange play dates and, and babysit while you go on, you know, go downtown to have to have brunch um, or do any of those normal things that you would do with your community anywhere else in the world. Um, we have very good relationships with our local staff. So our operations team, our facilities team, our HR team. Um, one of the things that makes our community so strong is that it is a full school community um, across all departments, divisions, and um, nationalities. So it is a very um, open and inclusive place. Um, and part of 
part of what supports that is we have cultural exchange workshops regularly. I think you see there we're making some traditional Chinese foods. Um, we also had a, a, a Thanksgiving workshop this year where we all made um, turkey, turkey handprints. Um, just, you know, the, the lovely things that we do in the US or in South Africa or in China that no one knows unless unless you're American, Chinese or South African. Um, and you know, there's a lot of people from very different places across the world um, that are represented here on campus, Jamaica, India, um, the UK, what have you. Uh, Spain, it, Spain, France, Italy, Russia, we have we have everything. Um, and people are really eager to share what they have. And there's a willingness to be to be wacky. Um, but we also expect uh, accept people who are not um, as maybe flamboyantly wacky as 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 I am. <laughs> um, the next slide is about where we work. So um, we have a lot to offer in terms of facilities. Um, it is maybe the, the least exciting thing for me just because it's the nuts and bolts, but nuts and bolts are also important. Um, we have three buildings. Um, one building is for ECE and first grade and administrative buildings. Um, so our youngest students do have a designated space closest to all of the playgrounds and um, age appropriate athletic areas. Um, the other building, building two, is boarding and canteen, so it has all of our dormitories for our boarding students and our fantastic canteen, which offers breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, and really, really delicious food, and we just got two waffle makers this year, so there's a lot to look forward to at breakfast. Um, and then the third building is purely academic, so it's for classrooms, and that's where our middle school, high school, and upper primary are, um, and that's that's where I spend most of my time. Um, we are really creative with space, so we have, um, and this is also, I think, a credit to supporting faculty ideas. So we have a rooftop garden on um, one of our buildings that was actually initiative by one of our music teachers who um, noticed the potential to have a garden and cafe space up on top of the roof of building two. Um, and we made that happen. So we have a, a beautiful cafe-like area up on the rooftop of building two where we often have faculty gatherings, um, dinners or barbecues. We also have a rooftop soccer pitch and tennis court, um, a track, playgrounds, all, all of the things that you would expect, um, library, dance studio, gym. Um, we do manage to offer everything and we have found, found fun places to do it. Um, so that's about our school. I think the next, the next slide is about where we live. Um, so I've talked a little bit about where we work. Um, Guangzhou is, my favorite city in China. Um, I lived a lot, a long time in Shenzhen, of course, and I've, I've been to all of the major cities. Um, Guangzhou is the third largest city in China. And I think, I think it's the best. It has, it has a lot to offer. I think one of the really special things about it is the mixture of old and new. Um, so there's lots of narrow alleyways, um, little wet markets with bossy old women um, demanding, uh, you, to hold their prices when you're arguing about the you know fresh fish or, or whatnot um and it's just full of surprises and excitement and it's a lot of the reason that some of us go internationally is to find places that are very different from where we come from and um guangzhou certainly has that to offer but in the background you have this incredibly modern city with towering skyscrapers um really clean well-functioning urban areas and everything you would expect from this, this metropolis, right? Um, technology, convenience, and culture. Um, close to the school, we have, uh, I'm, I'm partial to food, so I'm, I'm going to talk primarily about food. Um, we have lots of parks. We have Texas barbecue, um, amazing sushi, uh, a great new Mexican restaurant with a great margarita, um, traditional Chinese dim sum, of course. Um, and the housing that the school offers is very close to campus. So I personally bike to work every day. There's also a shuttle that, that goes between the different housing areas and comes to school. So it's very conveniently located. So the area close to school is really nice and has everything that you need. But if you want to venture downtown, of course, downtown, there's the opera. Um, there's our favorite 
two-star Michelin restaurant where my husband and I splurge at sometimes and starve ourselves for an entire day so that when we go, we can enjoy everything to the full. Um, it has everything that you would expect in a large metropolitan downtown, beautiful malls, um, great restaurants of all kinds, even a Korean Mexican fusion restaurant, which is quite interesting. Um, and on the next slide, I want to brag a little bit. So um, Guangzhou is also an incredibly green city. Um, and I tell people this, and I, I always tell myself, oh, in one of these webinars, I should show pic pictures, but I actually made sure to prove it to some of our new faculty. Um, I offered to take our new faculty on a hike, not last weekend, but the weekend before. Um, and we had quite a few new faculty show up and we actually left from the gate of the housing complex where many of us live, where I also live. Um, and we walked from that gate and you, you can see where we um, managed to get to on, on those two bottom pictures. Um, there's areas of bamboo forest, um, beautiful uh, areas for climbing um, and you know tropical jung jungle. It just feels great. You get a little bit of everything. Um, and that was a, a six hour hike. And actually one of our teachers brought his six year old son, which I didn't realize he was going to do. Um, but man, that kid, that kid could go. He was like an energizer battery. I think some of our, some of our adult faculty were ready to turn around, but the, they, they couldn't bring themselves to ask where the next stop off was because the, the six year old was asking, when are we gonna climb the ninth mountain? Um, so that, that was really great. But if you're an outdoorsy person, we're really well located because you can get to the city rather easily. You can get to you know all of your restaurants within a walk or a bike ride, um, but you can also go on a fabulous hike or go on a great bike ride. Um, my husband and I are both very outdoorsy people and this is like a perfect location for us. Um, on the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about um, work, because the city is great, but life is determined by the balance inside and outside of school. So I want to address a little bit um, why basis, um, why to join this ne network. Of course, there's lots of international schools in China. I think one of the most important things that basis offers is that it's a large network with a lot of growth. And I mean growth in two ways, professional and geographical. So um, we're expanding as a network. We have um, a lot of schools. I'm, I know that Tim will probably tell you exactly how many, um, and he'll talk about this growth as well. Um, but the increasing number of schools also means increasing opportunities. Uh, for me, increasing opportunities at other schools is fine. We're happy to have teachers and managers transfer between campuses. Um, but growth within a school is also very personally important to me. Um, so the ability for internal promotion. Um, I have all of my managers except for one. So all of my divisional management except for one um, is internally promoted from a former member of faculty. So they, they've taken multiple steps to get there. Um, many of them are founding members of the school. So they've been with us for a while, but um, I do, we have, and I've talked about this a lot, we have a lot of excellence here, amazing human beings, people and practitioners of their craft. Um, and it is important to me that they have opportunities to grow, expand and um, support the people who join us. So um, those those things I think offer a lot to, to a teacher at various parts, um, elements in their career. Also, the network doesn't only provide opportunities, it also provides professional learning and growth. For me, um, my most impactful moments of growth have been in my collaboration and work on roundtables and committees. We have many across the network that span different things. So I'm all on the English chair roundtable. Um, I'm in the, the high school pathways committee and you know, I'm on the head of school roundtable. And the amount of brilliant people that you get to talk to from different backgrounds at different schools um, and different schools that are in different um, stages in their development, right? Brand new schools, well-established schools. Um, and that cross-campus collaboration, um, that exposure to different ideas, different people, and coming together to accomplish a common goal, I think that's something that uh, a big network of schools can offer you. Um, and developing those mentor relationships or collaborative relationships with colleagues, 
or supervisors from other campuses offers you a networking opportunity that I think is really valuable, um, but also a learning opportunity that is potentially more valuable. Recognition is also something that BASIS does really well. Um, the schools are very generous and well, um, well staffed and supplied. So um, if you if you are working hard and working well, um, the school does a, a lot to recognize that work um, and rewards loyalty and excellence. Um, so I think that our teachers, if they're ever not able to accomplish something, it's not because of the school's lack of willingness to support their, that initiative. Um, Care and support for professional growth is important to us. We have professional uh, learning monies set aside at our school. We have some money at the divisional level. Um, depending on the length, length of contract you sign, there is individual um, professional development monies as well. And of course we have um, coaching from chairs and our divisional managers. Um, Cause I know that all of us are dedicated to growing our craft. And we have a lot, of, um, a, lot, a lot of avenues to pursue that inside and outside of the school. And of course, what are we looking for? Um, who am I looking to hire? Um, because that is the purpose of this, of this talk. I've spoken a lot about various elements of our school um, because I, I have done one of these webinars before and I wanted to talk about something a little, a little different um, in addition to the things that I mentioned in the previous webinar. Um, but I've spoken about how much I care for the students and the community on campus. Um, and so it is important to me that I bring in people who love kids and love teaching. Now, I don't mean you have to be somebody who is like, you don't have to demonstrate that love in any way, but you do have to gain energy and strength from your interactions with your peers and, and students. I, I think it's very important that um, that the people who come to our campus have a respect for um, and gain energy from the journey that our young people are on, right? Um, watching them grow and supporting them should be something that um, gives uh, you a sense of purpose. I want people who are still, still see themselves as developing in their craft. That doesn't mean you can be an excellent teacher. I want you to be an excellent teacher. Uh, you can be somebody who's been teaching for decades, um, but I want you to still have something that you are working on. Um, I want you to be able to critically identify elements of your practice that still need some polish and, and growth um, because I think it's important that we all see ourselves as a work in progress. Um, it, I find that people who are actively aware of and working on um, areas of their practice and themselves um, are most flexible, most open, most collaborative. Um, and in that sense, um, flexibility and collaboration, people who ask questions and ask for support. I think um, teaching is a hard job. We make all of our managers teach at least one class um, because it keeps us grounded. We remember the joys and tribulations of being a teacher um, and being able to ask for support when you need it is, is important and I want people who feel or are comfortable with um, asking for support. Um, I, I want people who get a sense of joy from their interactions with peers and kids outside of class. Now I don't mean social time outside of work hours. What I mean is I find that the most productive moments with kids, and this is certainly true in my own practice, but I know for many of the best teachers I've ever worked with, it's also true for them. Um, those moments where you come across two kids talking in the hallway about an idea that they have, and you say, do you need help making that happen? Or, you know, helping a lost ECE student in the hallway. Um, those moments where you get to interject yourself in a positive way into the life of a young person outside of the classroom. Um, those are kind of the moments where the students truly recognize that they're part of a community and not just a student, but a person. And that we're not just teachers, but we are uh, mentors and uh, leaders and um, sources of support and care. And getting us, you know, getting a kick out of, out of being there 
um, in a professional sense, but also a personal sense um, in the school as a member of that community, um, whether it's to students or to peers, um, bouncing around ideas in the teacher's lounge or while eating waffles at breakfast. Um, I think that is something that I'm, I really hope to see. And so if that sounds in any way enticing to you, I really hope you do reach out um, and talk to me about what's available and what opportunities might be possible for you, because um, this is certainly a place that, that can offer a lot. And I look forward to having more people join our exciting team. So thank you, Tim, for this opportunity and thank you to our audience. Yeah, well, Erica, thanks so much for uh, sharing a lot of insights about your school, some of the clubs and activities uh, you have going on there. I know we're gonna get to a Q and A a little bit later on, but uh, uh, biggest question I have for you right now is, is how do you determine who gets to be the mascot? When, uh, uh, so that, that's my biggest question. How do you, how, what's the selection um, process on that? Yeah, well, at the moment, at the moment, it's less an issue of who, who, so it, it's, it's more of a, a whittling down of candidates at the moment than a dragging, dragging candidates to be it. We do have um, one of our students uh, who actually was, the chair of the committee who brought the idea to our um, to our mind. She she must have just had a vision of herself uh, walking into a room and having an, an adoring adoring <laughs> audience of seven year olds because she at the moment fights people off every time there's an opportunity. Um, maybe because she gets to miss class when she goes to the the primary assemblies, but I, I think it's because she just genuinely likes to. Um, can be the face of the school. And that's something she gifted us and we're happy to gift her right back. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, I know that, um, you know, next time I uh, come to Guangzhou, I'm definitely gonna be uh, looking for a Korean Mexican fusion uh, yeah. experience. <laughs> and um, I I'm glad you mentioned that because you know, what some people may not know is, is Guangzhou is actually a, uh, a world heritage uh, location for cuisine. So New York, Paris, Guangzhou, it really is interesting that um, you mentioned that, but it, it is definitely, you can find anything that you're looking for, any type of cuisine from anywhere around the world, and it is amazing. So uh, great, uh, great place that, uh, yeah, there in Guangzhou. I well, appreciate you sharing some of the insights. Um, I'm going to uh, share some initial insights about working with the, uh, the broader network. So the, the network is uh, the Basis Curriculum Schools Network includes uh, the Basis International Bilingual Schools uh, in Asia, as well as the Basis Independent Schools in the United States. Uh, something that's really important to us is we are very mission driven. And being a part of the mission that we do have is you know, it's our, our mission is to provide our students with a transformative early childhood and K-12 education with a cutting edge basic curriculum through exceptional teaching and faculty mentoring will produce graduates who have brought intellectual capabilities, international perspectives, critical thinking proficiency, and creative problem solving skills to be leaders in their future academic and professional lives. And something that is really important to us is that, you know, we actually do have built into our mission faculty mentoring. And Erica talked about a number of the pieces of professional development and that we're looking for people who want to continue to enhance their craft and the way that you're delivering um, uh, insights and, uh, and instruction within your classroom is really important to us. It's something that um, we really look forward to uh, providing to all of our teachers and the people that join us as an organization. In terms of the curriculum, um, it is a, an accelerated curriculum that we do have. Um, it is, uh, it's more challenging or rigorous than um, what are sometimes considered uh, standard curricula out there, but uh, some core components that we're focused on, again, really building that love and respect of learning in those primary grades, getting into more of the middle school grades. Um, we're enhancing the academic mindset. We're, we're, we're building the critical thinking skills and, and helping students to develop the, uh, you know, uh, the approach and inquiry in pursuing uh, their interests. And then of course, in the, uh, the high school grades, we're fostering college and university readiness so that students, uh, they are taking uh, university level courses in many cases. And uh, so that way, when they move on to a university level, they, uh, they're very well prepared to take on um, the level of work, the rigor and the interaction that they will have at the university level. One of the ways that um, is extremely unique within our network is We've partnered with Berkeley Global. So uh, UC Berkeley is one of the top universities throughout the world. And 
we actually provide uh, Berkeley courses to high school students through our international schools. Um, we do have four campuses that participate in this program so far. Uh, Guangzhou is one of those um, leading the way with International with Berkeley Global. So it's something that's very unique. Students do have uh, the opportunity to receive university credits. Um, they do receive a, a Berkeley transcript um, as part of uh, university applications as well. Something that's extremely unique um, across international schools globally, uh, much less uh, specifically within China. In terms of results, um, you can see uh, universities, the acceptances that students have been able to um, receive. Um, over 90% of our students are accepted into top 50 global universities. Um, we also have 77% accepted into uh, top 30 programs. Some of the acceptances include universities like Boston, Carnegie Mellon, Columbia, Cornell, Duke, the Imperial College of London, MIT, Princeton, Rice, uh, Stanford, at UCLA, University of Chicago, Oxford, University of Toronto, and some of the top um, arts and design schools like Rhode Island, Rhode Island uh, School of Design. And um, they're able to really pursue their greatest interests and opportunities globally as they pursue their uh, education and you know, future career opportunities down the road as well. So with that, um, we're going to have Diana martinez Yagi share some additional insights about uh, what it's like to work and teach with basis. So, Diana. All right, and I, I don't think it's additional insights as much as that's reiterating what um, Erica said, but uh, just, just a few things, again, reiterating what she said, there's so much collaboration that goes on between departments. She was discussing how different, even different campuses across the network um, do a lot of collaboration with each other, have discussions, roundtables. Um, we have a great academic culture. Again, look at those the, the mascot, how the students came and with a plan of like a business plan and went and presented it to, to her to get you know approval because they already had stakeholders behind them. That's like that's our, our kids, this academic culture with these amazing students um, that achieve these high results. Um, again, the basis network, we have a very large network um, here in the states as well as seven campuses in mainland China with two opening up next year. Um, so again, very large network, which means a lot of career growth, um, a lot of opportunity um, to you know, get into these higher level positions. Again, just as Erica said, um, you know, they're starting out as a, as a teacher. A lot of our teachers then go up and move into um, department head roles or chair roles, um, and some even head of school, such as our um, one of our other uh, new new campuses, we have a head of head of schools who was actually um, a um, dean of, of uh, college counseling in Guangzhou. So it's just that great career growth progression. And back to what I said, base kids are amazing. Um, they make me feel like an idiot when I visit the campuses. They're just they're beyond the very intelligent. And look at again going back, they can create you know different presentations like TEDx. Um, and those kind of things. So really cool, I think. And next next slide. So <laughs> why, why teach in China more like why teach in Guangzhou? I mean, we just heard so much amazing things about Guangzhou um, that it's modern and has the um, historical points to it uh, as well as different, everything you could imagine is there. Um, the, again, why, uh, back to why teach in China, education is valued. So our students, um, all students in China, the respectful parents are respectful. That's not like here in the West where you feel like you are getting hit up by admin, you're getting hit up by parents, by students. It's completely different. Education is highly valued and so are the teachers, the respected. Um, new culture, again, different. It's East meets West, but also um, you can, explore all the new different things, uh, Chinese things, as well as um, different uh, international um, experiences with us in our schools. Uh, cost of living, low cost of living, there's a lot of earning potential that can come with um, working with us. And I'll go into the benefits and salary later to kind of show you um, how you can, you can save a lot of money um, by working with us in China. Okay, so going into the expat package, you get the salary and benefits. Um, so we do provide airfare to and from China at the beginning and end of your contract. If you're relocating from another location in China, we do provide relocation allowance as well. 
Um, there is also a return home slash travel allowance we provide once a year, which you can use to return home or travel um, with the quarantine times easing. It's a lot easier uh, for, for people to go and travel and, and experience other parts of uh, Asia or even return home during the uh, vacation times, like summer vacation is, is two months, just like it is here in the States. Um, we offer visa support. Our HR teams are amazing and we do, they do provide visa support. Um, we provide fully furnished housing. Um, so like Erica said, it's very close to campus uh, within biking distance, or we also have a shuttle bus that goes to and from campus. Um, we also have a housing allowance. If you, know, you do have a, um, a certain preferred location you like to move into, maybe after first year, you have a group of friends, um, you're, you're free to obtain your own housing in that sense, and we would provide a housing allowance for that. Um, we also provide health insurance, the global health insurance. You can use um, within China or outside of China. It does include the US, but uh, recommendation is you can use it for urgent care. I wouldn't go and, and get a heavy surgery in the United States um, with, it, with the um, health insurance. We do also provide tuition for up to two children um, with a teaching couple, it's up to three children. Uh, breakfast and lunch provided at the school, as well as there is a 10% retirement allowance, which you can put to or to retirement plan or pension plan of your choice. Um, I know that we have 401ks here in the US. Um, there are different bonuses, rewards paid throughout the year, as well as a completion bonus. Um, so our, our um, we're at the end of your contracts. Our contracts are three years long, so that's something to keep in mind too. And what, what do we require um, for, from our teachers? Uh, well, in order to obtain a, a visa, we do need uh, two full years of teaching experience. Uh, us as, a, as an accelerated school, we require a degree in the subject area you're going to be uh, teaching uh, for early years. That is a primary early years educate, elementary education degree. Um, also, we're looking for these really passionate teachers that can work with the students that are at that accelerated level, that are open to hearing, um, hearing uh, different business plans to, you know, for, for, to create a, a mascot or whatnot. We want teachers that, that are willing to listen and help their students through um, to achieve those goals. So that's a big thing for us. Uh, we want someone who can collaborate with the other teachers. We're really big on collaboration. So we don't want someone to just sit in the corner and not want to work with, um, with each other. We want flexible, hardworking, collaborative teachers. And if we have, you know, again, really high academic standards. So as you can see by the universities, the students are accepted into, um, our, our curriculum is, is really rigorous. So the students will learn physics, chemistry, and biology in the sixth grade. They also learn pre-calculus algebra one, algebra two in those grade levels. Um, to get into these higher level universities, they do start younger on those intense subjects. Um, we also, our students work very hard uh, in order to achieve those goals. We really want teachers um, that are willing to put in extra work, that want to um, you know, work alongside the students and um, work just work just as hard as, as the kids work. Um, so if you're, if you're looking to really influence young people and engage young minds and, and use all the passion that you have for your subject and, get, and have, um, teach students to be just as passionate as you are, then that's the kind of teacher we're looking for. Um, there still are some visa restrictions, so that's something too to keep in mind. Um, but that's what we, are, what we require on top of what Erica went over, what she expects and would like to see from teachers that are coming to her. Okay, so for the, um, if you're curious, uh, what, what can you expect when you work with basis international schools? Well, um, schools have mostly local students, so not, the, not all of the students are foreign expats or whatnot. Most of them are local Chinese students, and English is their second language. So it's quite important for you to be aware of that, or for you if you're coming in, to be aware that you're going to be teaching to second language learners. You can't be talking as quickly as as you do with um, you know, your, your foreign friends or what you've done back home. Um, you need to be careful about uh, figurative language and other type of things that may be difficult for second language learners to pick up on. Um, going back to what I said, flexibility is extremely important, um, especially um, coming into a school. Uh, you have to be 
you know, willing to be flexible. You can't be, you know, stringent and not want to um, be, um, what is it? Again, be flexible or not, not wanting to compromise on different things. Um, that's, a, that's a big thing for us. Uh, also, uh, if you have any children or dependents that will be attending one of our schools, it is vital for you to know that, again, our curriculum is highly intense. And so it it's very difficult for a new student coming from a different country. They have to leave behind their friends and, hey, guess what? You got to take physics. <laughs> so I think it's that's that's really something that you need to be aware of if you're going to be bringing over your children so that they can be ready um, to take on these higher level courses. And like I keep going back to growth, it's, it's like I said, great career growth. Um, we're going to be opening up several new schools uh, in the coming years. Uh, we're actually, our, we're, have, we're opening two new schools next year, our Nanshan Early Years campus, as well as our Wuhan campus. Um, and then in the future, uh, Guangzhou Bilingual. So that's expanding on our Guangzhou International Campus. Uh, Beijing and Shanghai campuses too are, are, are also planned. So again, lots of career growth is available and we're not going anywhere. All right, so go ahead, that's it, Tim, sorry. John, yeah, the, uh, yes, so for additional insights, you can find a lot more information and you can hear about and uh, see more of the stories from some of our teachers, uh, more of what's happening at our schools. But please feel free to uh, see some additional insights through some of our social channels like LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, we're on Instagram as well. You can get a sense more for the school, the community, things that they're doing, and um, some of the exciting happenings and developments um, by following some of those channels. You can also uh, see more of the stories, read more of the stories uh, through our blog. And then, of course, uh, join our interest list. Uh, by joining the interest list, you'll receive updates on some of the happenings and events and developments across our school, as well as um, when new stories from our uh, uh, teachers are shared out across, uh, across our network. But with that, um, we'll move on to the Q&A portion of our presentation today. And um, uh, I also have a, a question. So Erica, my, uh, my first question is, with the, uh, the, headline, um, uh, the, the, the headline story, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the newspaper, where did, did they ever find any actual, uh, any interesting excuses for anyone not participating in Spirit Week? No, I, I think I think it ended up just being a general, general too cool for school. And one article they had, though, um, in that, that issue that I was particularly proud of that I didn't mention was they also had a, and it was very, it seemed very cute when the title, I, I, I laughed it off. I was like, oh, this is typical, typical teenager. Uh, it was, headline can you like more than one person at once um and i was like yes yes the world needs to know is it possible uh -oh. to have a crush on more than one person at once? but it, it actually it was it was it was actually brilliant it was it was more about um uh it ended up being an article that was about different types types of of uh, love and um it was more of an exploration of what are the different types of relationships that are possible or out there so it ended up being a, it had a surprising twist like it the the title was quite flippant but the content was was much more um substantial so i i was as an english teacher i was oh, you must have really really had a, a great english teacher in your past because he's a really well art <laughs> well executed good good very good all right well um Diana, if you want to pull up some of the questions uh, from today, um, what do we have for uh, other questions so far? Sure. Um, one of them was going off of what I was saying about the intense, uh, rigorous curriculum. Are there any um, supports in place for students that are second language learners, um, you know, in terms of that intense curriculum? Yeah, so we we do have um, rigorous admission standards. So while our students are, for the most part, coming to English as their second language, um, many of them have lived abroad for extended periods of time. Um, but do, yes, it is true that most of them have Chinese as their first language. But when they do come in, we do make sure that they have a, 
uh, proficiency in the language that will allow them to be successful at the school. That being said, of course, admissions tests are admissions tests and life is life and, and nothing works out 100% all the time. Um, we do have an ELL team that supports um, in small group or push in um, interventions for our kids. So those kids who need additional um, support with literacy or phonics um, in, in the primary ages or more advanced support in um, composition or writing um, at the older ages. We do have a team of people who support um, and work very closely with our English teachers and our subject areas that are particularly language intense. Okay. Great. There's, there's another one. Um, so what supports are in place for teachers to learn the base curriculum? So I'm, I'm guessing that's like the trainings, but what other supports are in place? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, actually, this is a, a great question. Um, so we have the curriculum and it has what you would expect from the curriculum, right? It has your, your, your learning outcomes for each grade level, each subject area, the topics that you address, um, the depth to which you address those topics. Um, we do also have the chair on campus. So your department chair on campus is there. So they're your first, first go-to person for support. Um, we have a training at the big, before school starts just for new faculty um, where they get to know their chairs. They get introduced to the curriculum and they get introduced to, there's a teacher guidebook for each subject and department area. And that kind of is a comprehensive understanding of approach the classroom, um, what kind of assessments are run, um, what the the philosophy or, or justification and approach to that subject area is. Um, and for each grade level and subject area, we also have something called a CAD. So at basis, we, we do like our acronyms at basis. So it's a course advisor, right? Um, and that is a person who has taught that course successfully in the past and can give teachers resources or guidance if they are having trouble developing them, it themselves or, or they're potentially new to that subject area or grade level. Um, here, here's one that just came up. So what does it look like in kindergarten? Do you have a Chinese teacher, an expat teacher, or are there two Chinese teachers and two, and one expat teacher? What does that look like in early years or kindergarten? Yeah, yeah. so um, in early years, we have a lead teacher, usually an expat, um, but I, I, they're all expats from different places. Um, but the lead teacher is in the classroom um, and that, that would probably be what this person would be applying for a lead teacher position. Um, and then they have a co-teacher who is bilingual um, and fluent in Chinese as well as English. Um, and they are a co-teacher in the classroom. So that we, we don't like to call them teaching assistants because it is somebody, they will lead the Chinese lessons. Um, the because all of our students have learned Chinese just as you know, we would we would hope um, students would become academically proficient in their home language as well. So they do have a Chinese class um, and they are, help lead small groups when you're running stations, things like that. They should be an active and productive member of that teaching team. Um, and then there's a, a monitor. So that's a, somebody who helps with the nuts and bolts of the classroom. So helping to set out lunch, helping to make sure the kids finish their meals, cleaning up, um, helping with, uh, for earlier kids, younger kids, going things like going to the bathroom or getting them down to nap. Um, kindergarten doesn't have naps, but um, so you do have three teachers in that classroom. One is your co-teacher um, and you really, when you're planning, we hope that you plan with them, keep them in mind so they can best support the active learning in the class. And then the, the monitor who's, who's more of um, an assistant role who would help set things up, tear them down, help clean up, that kind of thing. Okay, um, another one just came up. Do you only hire American teachers or? No, no, no. <laughs> no we have, we have a, a very, very wide variety of uh, nationalities on our, on our expat staff. Um, we're one of the most diverse campuses in the network. Uh, we have people from everywhere. Okay, all right. Um, what, what portion of the staff are Chinese speaking? And I mean, we did talk about this a little bit, but, and what is, how many are English speaking? Yeah, so we have um, our lead teacher staff 
primarily, if not with, with a few exceptions, um, except for the Chinese language class teachers, who of course need to be Chinese, um, mm -hmm. the, they're all expats. Um, and we have LETs, learning, learning, uh, learning expert teachers, and um, the teachers in the ECE classrooms. Those are all bilingual staff so they can facilitate um, conversations with parents, parent communication, home, writing emails, that kind of thing. Um, so that, those are in grades um, pre-K one, which is our three-year-old classes all the way up through fifth grade. There'll be an LET for that for each group of um, students in that grade level. Okay. Um, let's see. Someone asked about the, the same thing about English, um, English language speakers as teachers. Um, what, I think we touched on this that last, um, the last uh, webinar, but uh, can you talk a little bit about the differences between AP curriculum and IB? Is it, if you're teaching, if you have a background in IB, is it difficult to teach our AP curriculum? Uh, yeah, so I, I would say it's it's not difficult to teach the AP curriculum. It's just different. It's a it's a different curriculum. Um, so if you are used to like, we have lots of teachers who are used to IBDP programs for the AP. I think the one thing to be aware of is the AP curriculum is meant to be an early university curriculum, right? So it it is. There, you can get college levels for those courses if you do well. So in a lot of ways, it's like A-levels or, or the DP program. So I, I would say, um, as long as you've taught the upper levels of IB, AP classes are not a problem. AP curriculum really is only for those classes designated as AP. So if you are teaching AP math or AP English lit or Lang, um, and those are only in high school. So it, I don't think you have to worry too much about that particular issue. Um, unless you're teaching specifically the AP courses in our upper high school um, and in middle school, certainly that's not something to worry about. I would say the different curriculum are, of course, different, but I, I wouldn't say there's a barrier to entry. Um, in a lot of ways, we benefit from having a faculty that's exposed to different curricula. Okay. Um, I think this next question is kind of going off what I said about our growth. So I mentioned the bilingual they want to go by the Guangzhou campus, so they want to know what's the difference between the Guangzhou International School and the Guangzhou Bilingual. I mean, it's not open yet, but I think they want to know. Yeah, no, that, I mean, the designation between international and bilingual school is, is an important one. And I think it might have been part of what people were getting at when they were asking those other questions about um, staffing. So the my Guangzhou school is the inter is an international school. Um, there will one day, I think, be a bilingual um, Guangzhou school, but this one is purely international. And that means the curriculum is purely international. We're not in any way guided by the Chinese national curriculum. Um, so we're, we do all the things that the schools in the United States do. Um, a bilingual school has to follow the national curriculum and do the basis stuff. Um, and so the there are two kind of different types of programs. One's enriched by the basis program, um, and 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 the other is is solidly international. That means we have, you know, we we have Halloween celebrations, Christmas celebrations, of course we it's holiday, winter holiday celebrations. Um, and we do the full AP world history, AP European history, AP US history, um, the full gamut of, of the US curriculum. All right, well, Erica, thank you so much. Um, you have a great school. I really enjoy uh, you know, when I'm able to visit. Well, uh, for those of you that have any, um, Questions, you can certainly email us at careers at basisinternationalschool.com. Of course, again, just to uh, set back and reiterate, um, if you want to apply for positions, please take a look at the positions that we do have open on our career site at jobs.basisinternationalschools.com. And again, you can see a lot more insights about the schools we have, uh, find a little bit more about Guangzhou. Um, we do have some video there, um, had a uh, wonderful, uh, unique, uh, creative tour of uh, the, the Guangzhou School by the, uh, I believe it's the, uh, the ECE team um, previously. So um, take a look at some additional insights you'll have there across the social channel. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Erica.
Thank you for your insights. Appreciate it. Yeah.